All right, you can be seated. <clears throat> We're going to continue our study this, uh, it's not the morning, <laughs> this afternoon on a false witness that speaketh lies. We're talking about, as we have been for the past uh, several weeks, of these six things that the Lord doth hate. These six things that the Lord doth hate. An important study, because if God hates it, I want to be far from it. I don't want to take part in it. I don't want to even appear to be doing what God hates. A false witness that speaketh lies is none of the things that God hates. Turn to Acts chapter 1 in verse 8. Acts chapter 1 in verse 8. If you look at Acts chapter 1 in verse 8, you will find the passage where God begins to explain to the, the newborn church there of their ministry. He says unto them in verse 7, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. In other words, don't be worried about these things. Don't be, don't be thinking about when Christ is going to come and take over the kingdom and all these things that you are concerned with and things that you are worried about even as you ask, Lord, will at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? He says this, he's like, in verse 8 it says, But ye shall receive power... After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the world. So God here is giving the charge to his disciples that once they receive of the power of the Holy Ghost coming upon them, they shall be witnesses. And as we know, and as you study the scriptures, especially in the book of Acts, whenever the Holy Spirit comes upon somebody, it doesn't make them shout and sing and run around or cry or do any of those sorts of things. The Holy Spirit coming upon a person is in order that they would have power to be witnesses unto God. In other words, they would be God's witnesses in this earth when they receive of the power. The Holy Ghost's ministry is that he would empower believers to speak of Christ. Because his ministry to us is that he would only bring things into remembrance whatsoever Christ hath taught us. As we read the Bible, the Holy Ghost brings those things into remembrance and allows us to be strong witnesses for the cause of Christ. And so God wants us to be witnesses unto him. If you were to turn it, you'll have to, to Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 5, you'll find it says here, A faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness shall utter lies. And it's clear which witness God wants us to be. It's the faithful witness. Why? Because we know from the passage of Scripture that we read in Proverbs about the things that God doth hate, the things that God doth hate. One of them is a false witness, and the false witness is an abomination in the sight of God, and it is him that speaketh lies. We're to be faithful witnesses unto God. What does it mean to be faithful? Does that mean that you're 100% all the time without error and without fault? I don't think so. What it means to be faithful is that you remain loyal. You are steadfast in the cause. You are true to the facts. In other words, you're focused on the facts. You're dedicated to what is truth. You are devout to what is truth. Truth, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're 100% all the time infallible and without error. Mistakes will happen even in our gospel witness, as we've all suffered them, as we've all fell, fallen short of giving a perfect and crisp and clear presentation and speaking only the truth. That doesn't make you a faithful witness. That's not what's confined to a faithful witness. Though it does say that the false witness would other lies, I don't think me making an error makes me a liar and makes me a false witness. Why? Because just last week... Um, I, I said a Bible quote, and I said that it was in Peter. And it wasn't actually in Peter. Someone pointed out to me that that Bible verse actually came from Galatians. And so there I made an error. I lied to you, right? I, I said something that was not true. But that doesn't make me a false witness. That just makes me human. And, and the same thing goes for all of us when we go to the door. I think a lot of people get frustrated or get scared or nervous. They think that when they go to present somebody with the gospel that they have to nail it. They have to speak the truth completely clear all the time and not even make a single mistake. And that, that pulls us from the ministry. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to put in us the truth, allow us to present truth facts and, and true gospel presentations, but that doesn't mean that it completely takes hold of us to where we cannot even make a single mistake. Mistakes happen, and you can still be a faithful witness. Why? Because you're loyal to the truth. You're steadfast in the truth. You're dedicated to the truth, and in as much as in you is, you are trying to be faithful in that cause to give a witness of God. If we want to be better witnesses, 
we need to work at. It is something that we can actually improve in. And one of the ways that we can improve at or we can know that we are faithful witness unto God is to be filled with the Holy Ghost and speak as the Spirit gives you utterance. Just across the page, if you were in Acts, it says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The main point of the passage here, and, is, uh, and if you were to remove what is in the parentheses, the book ends, or, or the comma in there that is simply adding to the sentence, is that they were filled with the Holy Ghost, spake, as the Spirit gave them utterance. That's what happened. The Spirit moved upon them and gave them the power. So we need to be filled with the Spirit. Well, how do we get filled with the Spirit? Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. That's one way that you can get filled with the Spirit. Another way is to pray. Shall not the Father presently give the Spirit to those that ask of Him? It's one of the ways that you receive of the Spirit and get filled with the Spirit. And simple Bible reading, hearing from God, allows you to be full of that good Spirit spirit. Next, you need to be sanctified in your hearts and ready always to give an answer with meekness and fear. So you need to set apart your heart. You need to be prepared unto the work that is before you. 1 Peter 3 and verse 15 talks about that. To sanctify your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to anyone who asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. In other words, have the right attitude when you go. Sanctify yourself. Set yourself apart to the ministry that is before you and just be prepared. If someone asks a question, you know, why? Why are you so happy at such a miserable day? Why are you so jovial? Why are things so going well in your life? That's a great opportunity whereby you can be a faithful witness unto God by speaking the truth from your heart of what you are experiencing from being in Christ. Another way that we become a faithful witness, something that we can work at, is study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth appropriately and, and properly and rightly dividing or separating or using or understanding or comprehending the Word of God and that comes through study. So study your Bibles, be in your Bibles, reading your Bibles, understand the different doctrines that you're going to need to present to people. That's another person, that, another way that you become a faithful witness unto Him. Be filled with the Holy Ghost, sanctify yourself, set yourself apart to that ministry, and study your Bible. Be prepared to answer people when they ask you questions or reasons for the hope that was in you. That's uh, study to show thyself. That's 2 Timothy 2.15. You can go and check that out later when you have a chance. So to contrast the faithful witness, we find the false witness. And that's what the, the scripture was talking about in specific. A false witness that speaketh lies is something that the Lord hates. Something that's abomination in sight. And that is disgusting in his sight. He wants nothing to do with the false witness. The false witness and the difference with them is, is they're not speaking lies like I did the other day when I just made a mistake. A slip of the tongue. I chose the wrong book for the portion, or the, for the portion of scripture that I was quoting. But the false witness speaketh lies, and they speaketh them purposefully. In other words, with purpose, with, with meaning. They did it on purpose. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 16, that's the portion of the Ten Commandments. It says, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And as one of the Ten Commandments, we know that it does have a preeminent or a prominent position within God's heart. He set forth Ten Commandments almost to kick off the uh, Old Testament law as he was going to expound unto the people of Israel all the things that he wanted them to fulfill and all the things that they wanted them to do, the practical law that they were going to live by. And one of the initial ten that he gave them was this commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. That shows to you, that shows to each and every one of us, that this is a very wicked sin. This is a sin before a holy and righteous God to bear false witness against your neighbor. Jesus in the New Testament took all of the commandments that are contained, and I've heard some people say there's like 600 of them, I've never counted, but there's many, many commandments and ordinances and statutes that apply in the Old Testament. Jesus brought them forward, though he changed some and fulfilled some, and, uh, and did away with some by bringing in the New Testament. He basically gave us this brief comprehension of the entirety of the law. He said, love the Lord thy God with all thy whole soul 
soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind. And he said, and love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. On these two, the whole law and the prophets is briefly comprehended. What it means is that if we were to have one of those, uh, those deck chairs, you know how people will sit on a chair together and they'll swing and you have the one rung here and the one rung there? The, the uh, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind is the one side of the swing. And love thy neighbor as yourself. That is what is hanging on. And the seat and where everyone rests and where everyone is, is riding on that swing, that's all the law and the prophets. In other words, so if one of those are to fall away, uh, then, then the whole thing comes apart. You can hang all of them upon those two laws. And if you think about it, if you truly love God with all of your being, you're going to love your neighbor as yourself. Those two Amen. go in sync. They, they, they work together. You're going to love God. You're going to love the, the people that God created. If you love the people that God created, you're fulfilling the law that God desired and that you would love everybody according to his purpose and according to how he set it forward. So love your neighbor as yourself and love the Lord the God. He said those fulfill all the laws. But if you are a false witness against your neighbor, you're committing a sin against one of the Ten Commandments, and an affront to God is where you'll find yourself as an abomination. And the other thing that happens is you're actually sinning purposefully against your own neighbor. You're taking both those commandments that are briefly comprehended upon the whole law, and you are breaking them. You're, you're destroying any chance of anything hanging. You're falling short. You are sinning in doing so against God and against your neighbor. Matthew chapter 15, if you would. We're at the beginning of your New Testament, you'll find the book of Matthew. And in Matthew chapter 15, you'll find Jesus here challenged by the Pharisees because he spots the disciples breaking tradition. And instead of going to the disciples, they go right to the leader. They go right to the Lord and they say, Hey, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. So here are the religious leaders of the time in Matthew chapter 15. Here are the, the, the head honchos of the religious institution that is mentioned um, in the Old Testament. That was, that was the reality of the people of Israel at this time, or the people of Judea anyways. And here he is challenged, why do they break the tradition? Why are they transgressing the tradition by not washing their hands? Jesus' response is very crisp and clear. He says in verse 7, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And so here, in a very pointed and clear way, he says, Hey, you're straining to keep this ritual. You're doing everything you can to keep these traditions of men. And all the while, you are negating the commandments. With your mouth, you're worshiping me. With your mouth, you're drawing near unto me. You're giving me honor with your mouth, but your heart is far from me. And Isaiah prophesied as such, you're hypocrites in doing so. You're worshiping me in vain. Why? Because you are teaching as if it was Bible truth, as if it was a true commandment, your made-up law, and then negating the commandments of God in order that you could follow this made-up law. Very clearly, if you look down in verse 18, Jesus outlines the teaching to his disciples of what he was trying to explain to the Pharisees, how they were hypocrites and, and what that all meant. And he brought in a few different parables to give them more understanding, even charging his disciples, are ye yet without understanding? Why don't you understand these things? Verse 18, he said, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth of the heart and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, and there it is, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashing hands defileth not a man. So what he's saying here is that these men were making a big deal about of cleaning their hands before they ate something. Something in their law said that that was how you became undefiled, was that you cleaned your hands before you ate something. That's good practice, but that's not God's commandment. That's wise to do, especially in our day, but it's not God's commandment. And if you make it into God's commandment, and then you esteem it higher than the commandments of God, you've sinned against him. The truth is that what actually corrupts a man and what actually makes a man inwardly um, defiled is the heart issue that comes out. 
Out of the heart proceedeth the thoughts. Out of the heart proceedeth the murders, the adulteries, the fornications, the thefts. There's a wicked heart within man which causes them to sin in this manner. And the sin of false witness is specifically mentioned here. It's one that defiles. It starts in the heart. It proceeds from the mouth, and that's when it defiles. James chapter 3 and verse 6 says, It defileth the whole body, referring to the tongue and how it works. It, as a little member causeth great destruction, great burning, great vexation to all those around it. That tongue is a deadly fire full of poison, the Bible says in James. And it defileth the whole body as it works. Turn to Proverbs chapter 12. Proverbs chapter 12. You'll find the book of Psalms right in the middle of the Bible. And a little bit past that, you'll find the book of Proverbs. <clears throat> so we want to be good witnesses. We want to be faithful witnesses. We don't want to fall in the line with the, the definition of a false witness. Why? Specifically because God hates it. God, God despises the false witness. It's a sin against him. It's a sin against his commandments. It's one of those sins that starts in your heart and defiles as it comes out. We want to be witnesses to the truth. We want to speak righteousness. We want to speak it rightly. We don't want to be caught lying. We don't want to be caught purposefully uh, deviating from the truth and being a false witness in any way, shape, or form. If you were to look in Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 17, the Bible says this, He that speaketh truth sheweth forth righteousness. And isn't that exactly what we want to do? And when we go and preach to anybody, when we're a witness to anybody before God, we want to speak righteousness. It says in the second part of that proverb, it says, He that speaketh truth sheweth forth righteousness, but a false witness deceit. So there is a deception to the words of the false witness. And Christians shouldn't be deceptive. They shouldn't be speaking a little bit of truth mixed with lies. They shouldn't be trying to coerce situations, trying to lead people to false suppositions. They shouldn't be trying to lie to people in order to get their own way. That's deceitful. And that's the trait of the false witness. Not only is speaking the false witness a uh, sin and ungodly, it is also something that is sorely punished. And I think people sometimes forget this, that God is still in the sin-punishing business. This is not just an Old Testament doctrine where God casts down fire on whole cities because of their wickedness or, or slays people because they have sinned against Him. We know very early in the New Testament, Acts chapter 4, the church just started. He just told you to go be witnesses. And Nice and Sapphira went and sold part of their possession, or they sold their whole possession, presented it as if it was the, it was the entirety of it, kept part of the price back, lied to the Holy Ghost, bear false witness against the Holy Ghost and God slew Ananias on the spot. Later on, Sapphira came in and she inquired of her husband. They asked the same question. Why have you lied against the Holy Ghost? Did you sell the land for such and such? And she said yes. And she agreed with her husband to the deceit, to the false witness that she had presented and she too was slayed on the spot by God. So God is still in the sin punishing business, make no mistake. And he doesn't just reserve it for the wicked, he reserves it for the just for those that are born again, for those that are saved by him in order to correct them, in order to enforce that others might fear. Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 5 says this. Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 5. The Bible reads, A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. Okay, now in verse 9 of that same chapter, it says, A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall perish. So again, the Bible, is in true fashion, it defines what it's talking about when it says that the one that speaketh lies shall not escape. The one that speaketh lies shall perish. They shall die within their own lies. They shall be destroyed by their own lies. Again, this is not necessarily talking about salvation. These are proverbs. These are truths. Just revealing to you the severity of being a false witness and speaking lies. You will not be unpunished for these things. It is one of the Ten Commandments. It is close to God's heart. Why would it be so close to God's heart? Well, I believe that Jesus faced many a false witness in his day. The Bible teaches that when he was being judged to be put to the cross, when the religious Jews brought him 
to the Romans, they brought false witnesses. And these witnesses could not agree one with another because they were telling lies. And they were condemned in their lies. They were exposing themselves as the liars that they are. But even still, to have the sinless Son of God have witnesses stand before him and try to lie about him, say he sinned, say he deceiveth the people, say he did all these things, all the charges that went against him. You better think that that is something that is close to his heart because he came into his own and his own received him not, the Bible says. He came unto his people for the purpose of saving them, for helping them, for strengthening them, for giving them a way that they can get to heaven, for giving them the way to salvation. And they lied about him. He came to his own and they did not receive him. So of course he's going to be hurt by this. Of course he's going to be uh, um, wounded by it. And of course he's going to in turn punish for it. Proverbs chapter 25 verse 18, we're talking about the false witness that speaketh lies. Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 18, it says, A why or a man that beareth false witness against his neighbor is a maul and a sword and a sharp arrow. Does anyone here know what a maul is at all? A maul? Okay, it's like an axe. It's like an axe, but it's, it's much, much more blunt in its shape. And it's, it gets wide really fast. The purpose of the maul, usually what you do is you drive the axe to get a hole, and then you take the maul and you place it in it, and then you usually take a hammer and you just strike the back of the maul, and that causes the wood to split. It's a wedge. A false witness is a wedge. He's dividing asunder. He is, he is placed in a position and he ruins, he destroys, he breaks apart that which was once whole. Do you want to be a maul in the kingdom of God? Do you want to be something that's, something that's causing division, someone that's driving wedges between people, between situations, that sort of thing? Uh, the next is a sword. Well, we know what a sword does. It, it cuts. It kills. It destroys. It harms. It hurts. A sword's purpose, especially a two-edged sword, is to cut in and to cut out. And that's what a false witness does. He, he not only divides and draws wedges, he cuts. And the next is a sharp arrow. A sharp arrow is something that punctures. It punctures from a distance. So a false witness isn't just somebody like the sword that would come and you'd see it happening as the, as the sword was entered into you and it harmed you in that way. It's not like the wedge where it's dividing asunder and it's in close proximity. The sharp arrow is something that can hit you from afar. And that just shows you that the false witness isn't just hurting people around them. The false witness and their lies can hurt people at a distance. It can puncture people. It can wound people. The thing about an arrow wound is sometimes people can survive it very easily depending on where you get hit, but it still hurts. It still harms. But the other thing about an arrow wound is that if it does happen to strike into vital organs, it is death that's certain, and it's a long and drawn out and painful one. And this is what a false witness does to people. They divide asunder, they cut, and they hurt people, harm people with, with longevity. It lasts, and even from a distance they can harm people. Christians ought not to be so. And how in this day do Christians bear false witness? You might be saying, well, you know, I, I, I don't do this. I don't lie to people. I don't purposely go out and bear false witness or hold on to false witness. In the day of social media, I think we might be surprised of just how often we do this when we forward and we share things without checking them out. Perhaps we are then bearing false witness. Maybe a news report goes out and you think it's 100% truth and you're going to stand behind this. Well, if you didn't check your facts, you might be, in fact, bearing false witness. You might be that maul. You might be that sword. You might be that sharp arrow that's hurting and harming people even from a distance. How about repeating stories just in general with not getting at all the facts? Just, just hearing a story from somebody and just sharing it with others as if you were there and experienced it firsthand. You might be bearing false witness. Exaggeration or embellishment. How often do we tell a story and then tell a story and tell a story? By the third time, it goes from I caught a fish this big this big to this fish was like the size of my leg, right? It's, it's the, the hyperbole, the, 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 the fish tail that everybody talks about. But there's more serious things that we exaggerate and we lie about in that way. We need to be careful not to take part in such things. Like hearsay. Hearsay is one of these things where you're, I, I heard such and such happened. Well, who told you that? Oh, from so-and-so. Were you in the conversation? No, I wasn't. Even this week, I had somebody come to me and they were trying to tell me how they explained a conversation that they had and I knew both parties. But my only response was, hey, I wasn't there. And I don't know what he was thinking. And I don't know what you were thinking. I don't know about your exchange. So I'm just not going to comment. Well, he said, well, that's fair. <laughs> but that's how we have to act as Christians. Don't get involved in the he said, she said, in the hearsay, back and forth type of thing. Because we might be guilty of bearing false witness. And that's something that God considers abomination. What about imagining mischief, just supposing things? You know, somebody takes a glance at you, or they don't shake your hand in church, or they walk by you, and suddenly you're like, man, they hate me. 
they, they, they must have been thinking all these bad things about me. And you start to imagine things, and then, and then maybe even share those things. Even if you don't, you are, you are supposing something to be true when it's not. And now that false witness of somebody simply glancing at you, or maybe they're looking at someone else and you thought you were getting a dirty look from them, or they saw a kid do something gross and uh, you're like, oh man, that guy gave me a dirty look. And you made up in your mind that it was intended for you, and now you're bearing that same false witness. And your heart has changed towards that person simply because of your presuppositions about the situation. Go with me, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 19. Deuteronomy chapter 19. And we're going we're gonna to deal quickly, as, far, as fast as I can, I'm going to get through uh, how God in the Old Testament dealt with false witness. In Deuteronomy chapter 19. So we as Christians do not want to be abominable to God. No way. We, we, we don't want to, first of all, because we love God. The Bible says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And God saved us from so much, an eternity of agony and hell. Um, the least we can do is to obey his commandments. Some of these least commandments. How about we start with, with, with in our hearts diligently looking over the ten and examining our hearts to see if there be any wicked way in us that we could be more like Christ and more like the Christ that he, that he can love, showing our love towards him in the, even the minor of ways. But not only do we not want to be abominable to, be, to God because of our love towards him, it's good for us to recognize and to think about and to contemplate the consequences of disobedience. Because I know that I can, I can seek love from my child all I want. I can, I can want him to do well. I can give him a list of rules. But sometimes that doesn't speak the same language. He doesn't, he doesn't obey simply because he loves daddy. He, he's loving daddy while he's disobeying, you know, in his way with his hugs and with his kisses. And so sometimes the consequence has a much more profound uh, solution to, to the sin problem. And so let's examine for a moment the consequence of bearing false witness. Deuteronomy chapter 19 and verse 16, the Bible says, If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong. So here we say this witness is purposefully rising up. He rose up to testify wrongly. It was the purpose that he had. It was his goal in this situation. Then both the men, verse 17, then both the man between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord. It says also before the priests and the judges which shall be in those days. So we bring both the man into the same room. And, and this ensures then that you're not going to have that problem with hearsay. You're not going to have that problem with imagined suppositions or exaggeration. Both the men are present, the political and the religious leaders are there in order that they might judge. And so the case comes before the judges, and there is diligent inquisition made. That's what it says in verse 18. It says, And the judges shall make diligent inquisition, and behold, if the witness be a false witness, and hath testified falsely against his brother. So they have made the diligent inquisition. They have heard both sides of the story. They have judged appropriately and found the false witness and exposed the fact that he has testified against his brother wrongfully. He has lied. He has, he has, he has bent the truth. He has driven that wedge. He has shot that arrow. He has drove with that sword. If it be found out... Well, here's what it is, verse 19. Then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. So shalt thou put evil away from among you. Well, what does that mean? As he has thought to do to his brother, as he had thought to lie and to tell the story in order to have his brother condemned, as he bore false witness and tried to charge the sin upon another man, that which he had thought to do unto him shall be done unto him. Well, what would that be? Well, if you look through the law, you'll find a false prophet was worthy of death. So if I approve or if I accuse someone of being a false prophet and I'm found to be a liar, I get the punishment that was due to the charge that I had made. In other words, I say, that guy's a false prophet and they find I'm wrong. Well, what does a false prophet deserve? Death. I get death. How about, how about murder, right? First degree murder. That guy murdered somebody, I saw it. I'm found to be a liar. He was worthy of death if it was true, but it was not. I lied. Death. What else? Theft. In the, in the Old Testament, theft was judged by restoring a fold back. So if I, I stole a item, 
uh, th the charge would be that I would have to return, let's say, threefold or sevenfold, depending on the situation. So if I say, that man stole something from me and it be found to be a lie, then I give him threefold or sevenfold of what was deserved because that same crime comes upon me. Verse 21 says, And thine eye shall not pity, but life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So whatever the due crime that I have accused the man of, whatever the punishment is, I receive back. If the punishment was he loses a foot, hey, I lose a foot. If the punishment was that he loses an eye, I lose an eye. And those weren't real punishments in the Old Testament. Those are simply examples. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. You are getting what you tried to do to your brother by lying. You are getting that in return. And what is the purpose of all this? And, and there's that saying that sometimes people will make, and they'll say, you know, an eye for an eye, the whole world's blind. Trying to, trying to mock the law of God, trying to say that it, it's some unrighteous thing, and that, that uh, an eye for an eye, and the whole world is blind. Well, no, because if people were wise, verse 20 would just fall into line. It says, and those which remain shall hear and fear, and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. Right? The purpose of the law is that it is enacted before the judges, and those judges make it a very public thing. And if that man who accused somebody of murder is found to be a liar, they put him to death, and then everybody that's present goes, I am not going to accuse my brother of murder. Unless I know for sure he murdered somebody, I'm not even going to open my mouth. It stops the problem of false witness at the source. Because people see the truth and they see the law come down upon people hard and righteously and justly. And they see it and they fear. And they don't do the same thing. Often people will mock the law of God in regard to the disobedient child. You hear that come up all the time with atheists, right? Like, oh, your disobedient child should be stoned to death. Well, first of all, in the context, the disobedient child was a drunkard. So it wasn't a child anymore. This is like your millennial kid that grows up and he's sitting in his living room eating chips off his chest, leeching off of mom, drinking alcohol, just being a total drunkard, striking his family even, just being a, a, a rotten derelict of an individual, a terrible person. They bring him to the judge and plead. They bring him to the judge and plead. They try to reach this child. They try to straighten him out in a loving way that the family would. Try to straighten out this kid. Bring in outside help to try to straighten out this kid. And if he will not hear, he's judged in the gates by death. And everyone's like, whoa, killing disobedient children? This is unheard of. This is barbaric. Well, what was the purpose of that? How many disobedient children do you think would have to be put to death in that way before all his buddies would... would you know, give them, give their head a shake, get a clue, go, oh, oh, I'm not going to disobey. One? Or how about if they even just knew that that was a law in the books? Maybe this would never have to be enacted. Maybe this law would never have to come to be. It's the law of God. The law of God is pure, right, just. It's, it's without error. It's Amen. perfect. Let's, let's believe the Bible. Let's trust in the law of God because, because it's the best law. It's, it's the most pure law. And it should be enacted today. I believe that wholeheartedly. Amen. But how many disobedient kids do you have to put to death before everyone else gets a clue and just, just stops doing what they're doing? That is why the false witness, who's an abomination in the sight of God, that's why the false witness that speaketh lies is abhorrent. And, it, and, is, and is, it's such an evil sin against God and to the point where it's something that he considers abomination in his sight. It's something that he actually hates. God actually hates the false witness that speaks lies. That's why the punishment is so severe. The purpose of the punishment being so severe is for those that don't obey God out of love but need to see the consequence. Maybe one, maybe two have the law imposed upon them because of their own, their own, their own foolish choices. But ultimately, that would make it so that the world was a better place and people weren't sinning against God in the same way. And we would love our brethren enough not to sin against them by lying about them. And we would love God enough not to sin against him by doing that thing to our brother. Don't you think the world would be a much better place if these laws were enacted? I believe so. Yeah. And I believe that's why God was so harsh with sin. Not because he hates us. Not because he wants us to, to be suppressed or to be pushed down. He did it because he loves us and he wants us to love everybody else around us. He wants the world to be a good place. And so he made laws that were contrary to human behavior because human behavior stinks. We're rotten people. Our flesh is extremely wicked. Our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And that same heart is where the adulteries, the fornications, the murderers come out of it. And the other thing that comes out of your wicked heart 
is the false witness, and that's blasphemy in the sight of God, and it's wrong in the sight of God. Sin still sin, and God judges it today. Don't be caught a false witness before God. Our laws in Canada aren't such that you're going to get put to death for it, but hey, God can do much worse. He still has the power, and he's still in that business. 